Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Good evening. This is Jamie, Epicure's head of community, I sometimes say, and uh, head of strategy and network development. Welcome to February's uh, clinical webinar. I can't believe it's February. I hope you're all home and healthy and safe and warm and cozy this evening for our wonderful presentation from Marissa Silver. Um, we've got a great presentation from her lined up on the intersection of eating disorders and gastrointestinal distress. Um, as usual, just an absolute powerhouse of a lady and uh, great expertise that we're all gonna learn from. Couldn't be more grateful to have her here. Um, as everyone is trickling in, I've got just a little bit of housekeeping to cover. And of course, introductions of our esteemed guests. So first of all, the housekeeping. You'll be on mute for the duration of the webinar, um, but Marissa will be happy to answer any questions you have at the end of the presentation. Please submit those at any time through the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom panel. The session will be recorded and we'll be providing your CPE certificate to all of you who are attending live via email. So please keep an eye on your inboxes for that. Um, for those of you who are calling in from your phone, we don't know who you are. So you might have to email us and let us know that you need your CPE certificate. Again, you'll get an email either way. So just feel free to reply if we can support you with anything in your practices. All right, so with that housekeeping out of the way, it's my pleasure to give you a brief introduction of Epicure before we get started. Um, we work uh, with an incredibly engaged uh, and outcomes-driven cadre of clinicians like yourselves, um, major health systems, thought leaders, private practices, patient advocates. We're so grateful that this cadre of our partners in health are turning to us to help their patients heal with food. We see every day that they're improving outcomes, hence they're turning to us to leverage our menu, which is prepared low FODMAP and gluten-free meals. We like to call it Mediterranean with a twist that we deliver to people's homes in all 48 US states. If you're not familiar with low FODMAP, it can be quite complicated, but Epicure takes out the guesswork and has been shown to reduce functional GI symptoms in up to 86% of people with IBS and up to 78% people, percent of people with IBD. Um, so what are some benefits? Sometimes there you might have patients, and we'll talk about some of them tonight, who might have disordered eating or eating disorders, or for whatever reason, uh, you might not want to go into the nuance and details of this restricted diet. So trying a few days of elimination phase friendly, low FODMAP food can help provide you some clinical direction before those in-depth education or other diagnostic procedures. Uh, and we make that easy by offering all of you uh, $75 to give to each of your patients to try Epicure on the house so they can have that upfront experience with a lower barrier to entry to see if it works. Um, like I said, low FODMAP can be complicated. So um, we take out the guesswork. Everything is, you know, low FODMAP, elimination phase safe and gluten-free, and again, delivered straight to doorsteps. So patients can relax knowing that the healthy belly-friendly food will be at their doorstep each week. And we make sure that there's a huge diversity of plant-based meals um, with plenty of fiber and protein um, and the other important macro macronutrients to ensure that your patients are eating a balanced diet. Um, and we give all sorts of other resources like tonight's clinical webinar. Um, we have recordings for each month's webinars on our resource portals. We have patient educational materials like brochures and custom discounts for each of you. And we have a ton of great content from experts like Marissa Silver on our blog and through our emails. So we're happy to be here for a resource for you anytime. Um, but really why we get excited to come to work at Epicure every day is the testimonials we hear from patients like Helene in Maryland, uh, who was so grateful to her doctor for having gotten the recommendation that Epicure might be a supportive option for her to eat low FODMAP. And without further ado, it's my honor to introduce tonight's presenter, Marissa Silver. She is a Massachusetts registered dietitian and culinary instructor who is passionate about helping her clients develop healthy lifelong habits that nurture both the body and mind. 
Marissa focuses on a personalized, non-diet, non-judgmental approach using evidence-based medical nutrition therapy. She currently works as an outpatient registered dietitian at Karuna Nutrition and Movement, and primarily works with clients with eating disorders, disordered eating, and gastrointestinal disorders. Marissa completed her Master's of Science concentration in food and nutrition specialization in the Coordinated Program in Dietetics at Framingham State University and completed her dietetic internship rotations at Signature Healthcare, Brockton Hospital, Sturdy Memorial Hospital, and two Boston Public Schools and the Burroughs Family YMCA. She teaches cooking classes at Corona because she knows firsthand how impactful hands-on culinary instruction is for both children and adults after teaching at the YMCA and serving as a nutrition instructor for the North Attleboro Cooking Matters. In addition to her community and clinical experience, Marissa worked for Plus One Health Management as an on-site health uh, registered dietitian doing corporate wellness programming and nutrition counseling and worked at the John C. Stalker Institute of Food and Nutrition at Framingham State University to promote professional development opportunities for her school nutrition teams throughout Massachusetts. And prior to becoming a registered dietitian, Marissa worked as a digital marketing professional, creating marketing strategies for businesses of all sizes, including national food and beverage brands. And she earned her BS in marketing communications and advertising and public relations at, at Emerson College in Boston. To learn more about Karuna, where Marissa works, you can go to the group's website at Karuna, that's K-A-R-U-N-A, for you, F O R Y O U dot com, and she'll be sharing her information as well. She's got an awesome presentation lined up for us. Again, please use the Q and A function, and we will field your questions at the end of her presentation. And with that, Marissa, we're so grateful to have you here this evening. Thank you so much for your time and for sharing your expertise. Thank you so much, Jamie. And can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Awesome. Well, hello, everybody. And um, thank you, Jamie, for that awesome introduction. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in tonight from your homes. It's a pleasure to have you all here for this presentation. Um, as Jamie mentioned, we're going to be discussing the intersection of eating disorders and gastrointestinal distress. Um, so Jamie gave me a little uh, introduction of who I am, but just I'm an outpatient registered dietitian. I work at Karuna Nutrition and Movement, and I love talking about where I work. Um, Kate Thomas, who is the owner of the practice, put this dream place together that I am so honored to work at. Um, we not only do nutrition counseling with all of our dietitians, but we also offer movement classes as well as we have a teaching cook kitchen where we do cooking classes. And I actually, when, um, when we are back in person, um, I do cooking classes with our community and with our clients. So it's a really special place that I'm, I'm really honored to work for. Um, as Jamie mentioned, I work primarily with clients with eating disorders, disordered eating, and with gastrointestinal concerns. So this is why I'm so passionate about this topic and why I see this intersection so often with my clients and why I want to share these resources with all of you. My passion is working with clients to have a healthy relationship with food and their bodies. Um, I want to specify I have no conflict of interest in terms of the studies I'm presenting or the information I'm sharing. Um, I'm sharing more for informational purposes to help you, whether you're a dietitian or another practitioner that's working in either space. Um, good timing. This is National Eating Disorder Awareness Week, so I'm so glad to be sharing these resources during a really important week to raise awareness for eating disorders. And I do want to caveat that um, I am going to be discussing different eating disorders and specific behaviors related to those disorders. So I do want to give a little bit of a trigger warning um, for anybody tuning into this presentation. So a little bit about our agenda for today, just so you have an idea of what we're going to be walking through. So I'm going to be discussing why do we often find that gastrointestinal concerns coexist with eating disorders or disordered eating? Why does that intersection happen so often? We're going to be talking about common gastrointestinal concerns associated with different eating disorders. And we're going to be reviewing some assessment tools that you can use in your practices to help identify any eating disorder concerns with your GI clients. We're gonna be discussing appropriate nutrition interventions based on where someone is at their point of recovery. And then we're going to be diving into things that are non-diet related that can be helpful interventions for these clients. 
So to kind of kick things off, I really like to discuss why am I presenting on this topic? Why is this important? And I know a lot of people register for this presentation because you've probably come across this either in personal life or professional life and seen that there is such a prevalence in obviously both of these concerns, but also a lot of intersection between the two. So first of all, the prevalence of eating disorders. So first of all, I wanna say that eating disorders do not discriminate anybody of all ages, races, cultures, and genders can be affected by an eating disorder, right? And this statistic I like to show um, shows that eating disorders affect 4.4% of the global population, specifically for the ages 5 to 17 years, so in our adolescents, right? But as we know, that amount is much larger. It's about 9% of the global population across all lifespan. So we know that eating disorders is a really prevalent concern for many individuals, right? And to make this very timely for everyone. So we're obviously living in a time right now with a pandemic in isolation. We're living in isolation. And eating disorders thrive in isolation. And if you work in eating in the eating disorder space right now, you, have made, you may have noticed an uptick in people coming to you with eating disorder concerns. I know myself, I've seen that personally in our practice. And this, is, this has been actually researched a little bit. Um, as of last year, the International Journal of Eating Disorders actually started to look at these numbers. And what they found is that individuals um, with anorexia nervosa, 62% of them reported in worsening of symptoms since the pandemic hit. And also um, one third of Americans that have binge eating disorder also reported an increase in their binge eating episodes. So we're seeing in real time, this, to be, this becoming an even more prevalent concern and even more reason for anybody who's here, who is a, um, a physician, a psychologist, mental health professional, a dietitian, whatever you may work in, why it's important for us to be looking at eating disorders concerns and disordered eating with our clients. And then to kind of look into the intersection of functional gastrointestinal disorders and eating disorders, I found that these, these are really staggering statistics. So what we find in the research is that functional gastrointestinal disorders can exist in up to 98% of patients with an eating disorder. It's pretty um, a profound statistic, right? And then on the other side of things, what the research shows is that 23% of patients with gastrointestinal disease have displayed disordered eating patterns. And if you're kind of looking at a comparison of that and the general population, it's typically around 10% in the general population. So what a lot of papers are starting to agree on more and more is that in the gastrointestinal population with clients, they have a higher prevalence of eating disorders, right? So even more important, if you are on this call and you work with somebody or work with many clients that have gastrointestinal concerns, we wanna have this on your radar. And then lastly, why this topic is so important is that when it comes to recovery, if someone's experiencing side effects or gastrointestinal symptoms, they can impede their recovery and they can make it harder for someone to want to regulate their meal patterns, potentially eat more because they're feeling very uncomfortable, right? So what I hope that everyone leaves this presentation with is some kind of interventions and next steps they can use that will not exacerbate someone's eating disorder, but help them both manage and treat the eating disorder as well as some gastrointestinal concerns. So now the question I always hear is, is it the chicken or the egg? Is it the eating disorder that causes the gastrointestinal concerns or is it the gastrointestinal concerns that cause the eating disorder? And the true answer to that is that there's no exact answer, it's kind of both, right? But when I dug into a lot of the literature, I found some common themes as to what people think is the root and what the science says is the root behind this intersection. So first of all, if someone is um, exhibiting disordered eating behaviors, 
that can definitely disrupt someone's digestive patterns. So for example, if someone is chronically restricting their food or restricting all day and then binge eating at night or potentially using laxatives or purging um, or engaging in other eating disorder behaviors like using weight loss foods like sugar-free foods, a lot of these things can wreak havoc on the digestive system and in turn cause some of these gastrointestinal symptoms and concerns, right? Additionally, which I think is very interesting, is that we're starting to see there's a lot of overlap in personality traits as well as psychiatric comorbidities between eating disorders and functional gastrointestinal disorders. And common ones are let's say, you know, anxiety or depression or OC or, or obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, and then for personality traits, potentially that perfectionist mindset, that all or nothing mentality. And what we're noticing is that kind of um, disruption of this motor sensitivity disruption alongside these gut alterations, it's kind of laying the groundwork for this perfect environment for a functional gastrointestinal disorder. So that is, I think, very interesting. Um, and then also, there are motility disorders in the gastrointestinal tract that can result from someone having an eating disorder or disordered eating. Specifically, if someone is um, engaging in kind of chronic starvation, malnutrition, and not adequately nourishing their body, there is potentially muscle atrophy in the gastrointestinal tract that can happen, which can then impair someone's gastrointestinal motility and can impact their overall digestion. And then lastly, this is one of the more emerging topics that we're seeing in the literature, but it's this dysfunction between that microbiome brain gut access. And as what we know is that there is this bi-directional communication, right, between the brain and the gut that has a lot of control over a lot of things in our body, right? And when someone has a functional gastrointestinal disorder, oftentimes the brain is kind of like misfiring and sending the wrong messages to the gut and often resulting in some of the symptoms that happen. Um, but what we're finding in some of the research is that when someone is undergoing, let's say, chronic starvation, and the, the research is showing that their microbial diversity is actually being affected, it's actually decreasing, right? And, you know, the research around microbiome and a bacteria in our gut and our bodies, it's still really growing, right? And we don't know exactly like what mine should be and what everyone's on this, this presentation should be yet. But what we do know is that it's incredibly important to promote diversity in the microbiome. So if we're seeing in eating disorders that the diversity is negatively impacted, um, that can be something that we can look into. Um, and also that can show why there is maybe some dysregulation in appetite and hormone and can look at both sides of both the functional gastrointestinal disorder as well as the eating disorder. So I think that's really fascinating stuff and hopefully we'll have more research coming out about that as well. So to dive into common gastrointestinal concerns with eating disorders, I just want to give a really brief overview of the different eating disorders I'm going to be discussing just so that if you're not familiar, you have a little bit of background. So first of all, anorexia nervosa, and these are all from the DSM-5 manual, so this is where the definitions are coming from. But anorexia nervosa, the idea is um, the diagnosis is from restriction of intake that usually results in a significantly low body weight. There's kind of an obsession with um, thinness, an intense fear of gaining weight. And there are two types of anorexia nervosa. There's the restricting type, and then there's the binge purging type. When it comes to bulimia nervosa, the um, diagnosis is that someone is experiencing recurrent binge eating episodes, which is they're eating large volumes of meals in a certain period of time. And then there's often a compensatory behavior that comes after that. So whether that's um, laxative abuse, purging, compensatory exercise, or some kind of, ex so some kind of compensation that is used to prevent weight gain. 
and that needs to happen at least one time a week for three months to be diagnosed as bulimia nervosa. And then there's binge eating disorder, which is kind of those recurrent episodes of binge eating, but there's no compensatory behavior that comes after that. And usually um, it's an episode where someone's eating a large amount of food that they would not typically eat in, in one sitting. Um, it's often done when someone's alone. Um, they're trying to avoid kind of the shame and guilt around their binge eating. Um, it's often done very rapidly and a lot faster than they would typically eat. And it's basically what um, I hear a lot from clients is that it's kind of an out-of-body experience where you have just a lack of control of what you're doing in that moment. Um, and it to be diagnosed, it has to occur one time a week for three months. And then the last one I'm going to review is one that is we're learning new things about it all the time now, um, but it's avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, which you may have refer heard it referred to as ARFID. And ARFID is different than the first three I reviewed because it's a feeding disturbance that has very little to do with a fear of weight gain or a negative body image. And it has more to do with um, a lack of interest in eating, a um, avoidance because of sensory or textural issues with food. And the one that's really kind of key here in this conversation about gastrointestinal concerns is that it often can be re re related to this fear of adverse reaction to eating a food. So for example, some people have had really traumatic experiences with choking or vomiting. Some people have had a lot of gastrointestinal concerns around eating, right? And so what I'll dig into the research a bit more is that we're seeing that there is a fear because of GI issues as well around eating that can kind of facilitate some of these ARFID symptoms. And oftentimes it results in significant weight loss. And oftentimes these patients need to depend on oral nutrition supplements and at a higher level, oftentimes nutritional support. Um, so it, you know, it usually results in a significant weight loss. And that's why it's so important to be having a very strong interdisciplinary team in these cases to help with someone in recovery. So some common GI concerns that um, we see in the research and I see firsthand with eating disorders is these on this slide, right? These are kind of across the board with all the eating disorders. And I'm gonna go into individual ones after this. Um, but one of them is functional heartburn. Another is functional dyspepsia, which is typically like a series of symptoms, um, usually kind of like burning in the stomach, early satiety of a fullness in the stomach. Um, irritable bowel syndrome, which we know is also a functional gastrointestinal disorder, um, usually involves um, changes in stool consistency, changes in um, defecation frequency, and usually has a lot to do with pain and discomfort related to defecation. And typically you have two or more of these symptoms, and that qualifies for irritable bowel syndrome. Also bloating, constipation is a very common one across the board, dysphagia, which is difficulty swallowing, and then anal rectal pain is another one that we see across the board for these eating disorders. Now specifically diving into anorexia nervosa. So what, when you dig into the research, you see that there is a really high prevalence of individuals with both types of anorexia nervosa reporting gastrointestinal symptoms and concerns. And specifically, um, nine, over 90% 90 of patients with anorexia nervosa restricting type report symptoms. Common ones that we see specifically for anorexia nervosa, a lot of it is around this like post meal fullness, early satiety, kind of this abdominal distension, pain and nausea. And when you think about it, if someone is under eating for a long period of time, their body starts to go into starvation mode, right? And it starts to slow down certain processes that it deems less important than the more um, it, integral and life-saving processes, like our heart beating, our brain functioning, right? And oftentimes, one of the things that happens is you get a bit of a sluggish gut which can result in that distress. 
but also it can be attributed to a motility concern. So gastroparesis, delayed gastric emptying, is one that is commonly seen in anorexia nervosa. And that's really because um, if someone's in that chronic starvation state, they, as I mentioned before, they can have that smooth muscle atrophy in the GI tract, which then results in this slowing down of gastric emptying time, affects the intest intestinal transit time, and then causes that disturbance, which slows down overall motility. Um, also constipation. So, you know, the exact mechanisms are, are kind of um, dependent on the client, right? But a lot of that constipation could be due to like that abnormal colonic function that happens due to that malnutrition. Um, it could also be attributed to if someone's um, has the anorexia nervosa binge purging type, it could be due to like that electrolyte disturbance, which can in fact impact the nerve bowel function as well. And then also something we always want to look into is that some of the some of the comorbid psychiatric illnesses that are potentially common in anorexia nervosa, some of those medications can also cause constipation. So often we see in like tricyclic antidepressants, that's a huge side effect. So it also could be due to the medications as well. Um, another one that is more of a severe and less you know, common one, but is often included in the literature when we see common gastrointestinal effects of anorexia nervosa is the superior mesenteric artery syndrome. And the idea of it is that when someone is um, has protein malnutrition or getting inadequate nutrition on an ongoing basis for a long period of time, especially a very low amount of nutrition intake, there is um, a mesenteric kind of fat pad under this artery that helps keep this artery at the proper angle, right? And as that fat pad starts to waste away because of the malnutrition, they, the angle starts to change and actually can compress against the third part of the duodenum. So that can actually cause an obstruction. So obviously concerning, wanna you know, be working with a gastroenterologist to be monitoring these types of concerns, um, but something else that is common with this eating disorder. Also irritable bowel syndrome is also very common in anorexia nervosa, as well as pelvic floor dysfunction. And Dr. Karen Phillips actually did the presentation um, last month all about pelvic floor therapy and she's absolutely wonderful. And what we find is that it is very common in anorexia nervosa. And in that situation, it's an anatomical concern that does require um, physical therapy versus a nutrition intervention to help remedy. But pelvic floor dysfunction can also cause chronic constipation. Um, and that can also be a, a very uncomfortable thing for, for clients with anorexia nervosa. So moving on to binge eating disorder. So common concerns um, in the GI tract specifically for, for binge eating disorder. On the upper GI tract level, it's often heartburn, acid regurgitation, dysphagia, and then the lower side, it can be diarrhea, constipation, and bloating. And um, what the, the literature shows is the mechanism behind this is if someone is kind of having these huge volume binge eating meals or series of meals, it's quite a bit of overload on the system. And also it can kind of cause that, that pressure on the, the abdomen, which can then cause that kind of heartburn and that reflux a bit. And, um, and then also on the lower GI side, you know, that overload, whether it could be, you know, a lot of higher FODMAP foods, um, it could be a lot of, you know, sugar-free artificial sweetener type foods, but it can kind of cause this disruption in digestion, but it could be kind of that huge osmotic load, which then that often results in like a diarrhea result or constipation could be based on the types of food that they're eating. I've had many clients share with me that they often feel very constipated the next day after um, a binge eating episode. So um, we see a lot of these commonalities in terms of these symptoms. And then one, which is a little bit more rare, but I'd like to mention it because it is kind of a life-threatening thing is um, acute gastric, um, often said dilation or dilation, 
but it's basically the gastric blood flow is obstructed, which obviously is very concerning and life-threatening. So um, that is more in rare situations, but it has been reported in, you know, someone who is restricting and then having a really excessive binge eating episode. For bulimia nervosa, um, common symptoms are like heartburn, acid reflux, and GERD, which is gastroesophageal reflux disease. And um, that often is attributed to someone that's compensating through pur purging. And also postprandial fullness, epigastric pressure, and nausea are common in this population. And then um, this study, although it was a small sample, and I have to say a lot of the research is often using a very small sample, um, but it looked at 64 patients with bulimia nervosa in an outpatient eating disorder clinic. And what it found was 68.8% of those patients met the criteria for IBS. And what I saw across a lot of, um, of the science was that, that IBS is common in this population. And then once again, constipation is also common, and it's very similar to why we see it in anorexia nervosa. In it could be due to medications that are being taken, um, and it also could be due to those electrolyte disturbances that are caused by someone kind of purging on an ongoing basis as well. Now, when it comes to ARFID, a lot of the literature out there is based on the adolescent population, but we're actually starting to see more for the adult population. So I wanted to share some of these interesting studies because I think they're, they're, they're helpful and um, kind of enlightening as to more about this population. But common things we see in the ARFID population are like nausea, vomiting, dysphagia, IBS, and um, looking at this first study that I have here in the slide is that this study by Herrera et al. actually looked at 317 adult gastrointestinal clients. Um, and what they found was that 19% of those 317 actually screened positive for ARFID. So this is a specifically within a GI community, right? And they also, and they used, which I'm going to talk more about, is the not the nine-item avoidant restrictive intake screening tool, which I'll walk you through after. But what they also found was there was, was a significant association with the symptoms of, of nausea, vomiting, dysphagia, and IBS when someone tested positive for ARFID. So they're seeing these commonalities in the symptoms and the eating disorder. And then this, this study was done by Mass General. And it looked at 410 neurogastroenterology patients. And what they found in those 410 individuals is that ARFID symptoms, so not necessarily they met the criteria for ARFID, but ARFID symptoms were present in 23% of them. And then of that population, 6.3% met all the criteria for ARFID. But what's really actually interesting is that only one was actually officially diagnosed with ARFID. So that's, you know, really an important thing to see because it's important to raise awareness of ARFID because it's more of a newer diagnosis and one that may be underdiagnosed in a lot of our current clients, past clients, but or, or future clients, right? So something to keep on our radars. And then also, which I think is a very significant and important thing to take in from the study is that 93% of the patients that met the criteria for ARFID, so that was about 90 patients, they reported that their fears around food were related to gastrointestinal symptoms. So just kind of think about that. So a lot of their eating disorder concerns were just fear, not just fear, but that I'm not be, um, demeaning that at all, but their fear was around how their stomach was feeling, how their body reacted to food, right? And so this is so important for all of us who work with individuals with gastrointestinal concerns to be looking out for, they may be struggling beyond just gastrointestinal symptoms. They may be really afraid of food. They may be not meeting their nutritional needs and their energy needs. So we need to be thinking of that and looking out for them and advocating for them within their um, interdisciplinary team. So now that you kind of have an idea of why this intersection occurs between eating disorders and gastrointestinal concerns, 
you're probably wondering now, what do I do with this? Now, how do I kind of use this in my, in my practice? So what I wanna share is how do I screen first for an eating disorder? And um, everyone here probably comes from different professions or maybe you're just kind of interested in learning about this topic, but um, you probably do assessments in different ways with clients. Um, as a dietitian, our, my initial appointment is a long, very comprehensive assessment. It's over an hour long. And I go through a ton of questions. I always tell my new clients, I'm like, it's gonna feel like an interrogation. I promise it's not, but I have a lot of questions I ask, right? So in your assessment, whether it's you send something prior or you do something in person or you're doing something virtually, you wanna to start to kind of look at some of these things. So review um, individuals' family and personal history. Um, if there is already a known overlap, look into the history of gastrointestinal concerns, look into eating disorder history, because um, we know that there is also a genetic component there. You wanna look at the onset, onset of symptoms. So if I'm working with a client that has a diagnosed eating disorder and they're reporting to me that they're experiencing distress, um, gastro, gastrointestinal distress, I'll ask, you know, when did the symptoms start? Um, was it during, when it was before you had these disordered eating behaviors? Was it after, was it as you started to kind of add more food in or change your eating pattern? So I have to kind of look at when things started. Um, I also look at specific symptoms. What are you experiencing? Where do you feel it? And I also kind of say like rate the severity from one to 10. So I have an idea of how much this is impacting the person, how much it's impacting their quality of life, and also how it could also impact their recovery if they're really suffering on a constant basis with a gastrointestinal concern. And then I'm gonna go into the screen tools, but then when appropriate, um, I use a screening tool to see if there's a possible eating disorder going on. Um, I'll ask about medications. I also look into mental health history because we know that that also has an overlap intersection with both things. And one thing, I, if you leave with anything from this presentation is that do not assess somebody for an eating disorder by how they look. I can't emphasize this enough. There is no look to an eating disorder. So, I, I really wanna reiterate that if you see someone, you're like, they look like a normal weight, there's no way they have an eating disorder, please think again, and please make sure you're assessing based on what you're hearing and what is going on. Um, and also, I also wanna emphasize that it can take many sessions working with a client, specifically if it's a GI client, that you don't have any information about eating disorder concerns. It can take several sessions for you to start to unpack and uncover that there's something there. And one thing that um, when I started working with this population, I learned from Kate Thomas as our owner, is that individuals often with eating disorders, they're not always, um, they sometimes kind of aren't sharing the truth, especially in the beginning, right? And it's not that they're trying to be malicious. It's not that they're lying. They're just simply trying to protect the eating disorder, right? So that's why it's so important in this population and really any population we work with, to really kind of build that rapport with our clients so that um, they feel trusting of us and they're more, more likely to be sharing that they're struggling with things and more likely to bring up these concerns when they need to. Oftentimes as a dietitian, I may be the first person that has ever heard that there is eating disorder concerns and someone really has never talked to anybody about it it's never been brought to light. And so it's a very new thing for them. It's a very new thing for our conversations. And so it's important to be able to recognize when it's happening as a dietitian or another professional. Now to kind of go into the assessment tools that we have, I do wanna say first and foremost that these screening tools are meant for eating disorders. They have not been validated for the IBS or the GI population. However, because um, we don't have that tool yet, I hope we have a tool like that soon, um, but these are good starting points for you to assess eating disorder concerns. And they're very quick and they're kind of easy to use. So first of all, there's the SCOF questionnaire, which a lot of people probably have heard of this one. It's a very brief one. So it's one that you can easily throw into a session, not kind of spend too much time on it. But it asks questions like, do you make yourself sick because you feel uncomfortably full? 
would you say that food dominates your life? It's kind of overarching questions as to, you know, what's going on. And basically, if someone says yes to a question, it counts as a point. And a score of greater than or equal to two likely is you want to look at anorexia nervosa or possibly bulimia nervosa to see if there's something else going on. But this kind of gives you that that gauge as to are, is there something more here that we should be talking about and discussing? Um, another one that we often use at my practice and we often send it in advance of appointments is the EAT26 assessment. And this stands for Eating Attitudes Test. It's a much more detailed assessment. I've done this in person with clients, but it can be helpful to kind of send it over before, um, especially if there is a known or diagnosed eating disorder. Um, but it basically looks at, you know, thoughts and feelings around food in someone's body. And then they'll answer things like always, usually, often, or sometimes. So like examples, the first question is, I am terrified about being overweight. And they'll answer based on this scale where they feel it falls. Um, and a, a score of greater than 20 is that there's a concern possibly with an eating disorder and requires further investigation. And then a score less than 20 can still be consistent with disordered eating or eating disorder, right? And as I said before, you may not be getting the full story when you first give them this assessment. So if you're noticing a few red flags in what they're saying or how they're responding, you should still be thinking about it in how you're working with the client. Um, another assessment tool, this is specifically for RFED. Um, this is the nine item avoidant restrictive food intake disorder screen. And this one has nine questions. So it's also very fast, doesn't take too long to go through. But the idea is that it has these different statements and then there's this Likert scale where someone responds if they agree, slightly, slightly agree, slightly disagree, whatever it may be. And it kind of gives you an idea of how they're kind of responding to food and if there is a concern for ARFID. And a score of greater than or equal to 24 is considered a positive ARFID screen. So this is another kind of tool to have in your back pocket if there's any concerns about someone having ARFID or having ARFID symptoms. Other things to look at besides just the assessment tools are kind of some patterns and red flags you, you recognize in your conversations and meetings with clients. So um, something that I'll see is if I'm working with a client specifically for their gastrointestinal concerns and I start to see that there's possibly progressive food restriction, um, they're cutting out a bit more foods, I'm noticing that they're not having kind of balanced meals and snacks, I'll start to kind of look into that too. Um, let's say you have been working with them on a low FODMAP plan and they're totally not interested in adding back foods. That's something you want to look into too. Um, you, Because as we know, as anybody on this call who does the low FODMAP plan, right? From the very beginning, you're saying this is temporary. We're doing an elimination, then we're doing reintroduction and we're trying to add back as many foods as possible. Um, so if someone's not on board, you want to kind of understand what's happening there. Um, also, the screening tools start to point to um, a possible eating disorder. If you're noticing any decline in their medical stability, like someone saying that they're feeling lightheaded or dizzy a lot, or they're going to the doctor and there's things coming up from their doctor's appointments that you want to look into. And then, of course, as we can see, if someone has an increase in gastrointestinal symptoms, all right, well, let's see what's happening here. If it's not, if it's not your interventions or your interventions are not working, Let's look into what they're eating and how they're eating, right? And dig a little further into that. So now you're probably wondering, well, now how do I actually address gastrointestinal symptoms? How do I manage them with an active eating disorder, right? And so what I really wanna emphasize is we do not wanna be doing a full elimination diet or restrict a ton of things when someone has an active eating disorder. We do not wanna be exacerbating their fears and their concerns around food, right? So we wanna emphasize that food is just a part of this puzzle and it's never just food when we're having these symptoms. So it could be you know, stress and sleep and other things going on. It's just one part of this overall health puzzle. 
Um, what you really want to be doing with someone with an active eating disorder is treat that eating disorder and improve their relationship with food. And I'm going to explain in the next slide why nutrition rehabilitation is kind of our first step. Um, and then also, if someone has concerns, you also want to be working with, let's say, a gastroenterologist to do the proper clinical assessment, whether it's a, a breath test or whether it's an endoscopy so that you actually know what you're working with and that there is an actual motility disorder or there is some other functional gastrointestinal concern, you have the proper assessment to be working on it with the client. So um, after digging into the research on what are the benefits of nutritional rehabilitation, I do wanna say, that a lot of the research does not have that pre and post design that really shows like after recovery, how someone's symptoms are affected. So there was few and far between, and a lot of them looked at very different results. So they were heterogeneous. And also I wanna say they primarily focus on anorexia nervosa. So I just wanna kind of specify that. Um, we're obviously looking at the big picture of eating disorders, but a lot of this data is specifically for anorexia nervosa. But what the data says is that when someone starts to work on increasing their nutrition, meeting their needs, working on that relationship with food, kind of regulating and having more normal patterns of eating, what we see is an increase in microbial diversity. We see a decrease in lower GI symptoms like constipation or diarrhea, not as much the upper GI symptoms. For gastric emptying time, after mid to long-term rehabilitation, we see an improvement of that, but not as much after short-term. And so that's really important to be kind of managing the expectations of our clients that, you know, this can be a really long haul for working on some of these symptoms that have either happened before or as a result of disordered eating habits. Um, the research also shows there can be a decrease in irritable bowel syndrome prevalence, an overall kind of improvement in GI symptoms. And then obviously, if someone's kind of developing this more healthy, consistent pattern with eating, this can help resolve a lot of those symptoms that may be coming from, you know, eating a lot of diet foods, excessive caffeine or fluid intake, whatever it may be that can be triggering some of the GI symptoms. So we wanna first focus on that nutritional rehabilitation and working on that relationship with food first and foremost. And I will just say, just kind of building on this, I know I don't have too much time left, but um, what we also find in the research is that oftentimes these functional gastrointestinal disorders that go with eating disorders, they often kind of evolve throughout someone's experience with an eating disorder and even through recovery. And they often exist independently of the eating disorder and can exist long after someone is in recovery. So um, that's why it's important to kind of be working on both of them at the same time, but also managing the expectations with clients that it may just not go away with recovery as well. And so what I'm gonna share next is some things that you can do to help with clients that you're trying to work on nutrition interventions. You're trying to get them to support their bodies and nourish their bodies, but they're kind of feeling unwell, right? And things are not sitting as well um, because they for so long have been having these um, maladaptive eating behaviors. So one of the first things you can do is kind of modify texture. So I find that sometimes people can tolerate, let's say nut butter versus nuts or a smoothie versus fruit. So kind of modifying that texture can also be really beneficial as someone tries, as, as someone is working on kind of improving their eating habits. Um, also meal spacing and size. So as you're working with someone, they don't have to necessarily do three meals, two snacks, right? If someone is unable to tolerate that large load of food at once, maybe you move into six to seven meals and you work to make sure that when they're having those smaller meals, they're meeting their needs over the course of the day. Also, for specifically for constipation, I'm sure you've heard many times in Epicure presentations, but research has shown that two kiwis a day can actually really help be helpful for IBS constipation and kind of that chronic constipation. So that can be a way to kind of add in something that can provide some relief for constipation. Of course, adequate hydration is important. And of course you wanna make sure that it's fitting um, because we, we are have, we do have sometimes concerns with fluid intake with this population. So you want to make sure you're providing parameters around hydration throughout the day. And then even just using a stool can help with the position 
um, of someone when they're going to the bathroom to actually help with the ease of defecation as well. So squatty potties, you've seen those. Um, there's different brands now that do it, but any kind of stool that helps kind of elevate the legs can be helpful for that. If someone is experiencing like slowed motility or gastroparesis, um, I find kind of when they start to work on their nutrition, you can do like a, a 30% or a partial amount of their nutrition coming from liquid or semi-solid nutrition. And that can also help with tolerating that increased intake. And you obviously want to tell them to drink slowly. Um, and then you want to make sure you're looking at excessive fiber intake because fiber can slow down digestion even further. Um, typically in a general population with gastroparesis, you would also look at fat intake, but because if someone's trying to weight restore or increase their intake, fat can be a really important way to do that. So really I'd recommend focusing more on that texture modification as well as the fiber intake. For nausea, you can do ginger tea. For overall GI discomfort or IBS symptoms, peppermint oil has been well researched to help with that anti-spasmodic effect. Um, digestive enzymes like um, lactate or beano can be helpful, um, especially if someone's kind of developing an intolerance because of their eating disorder. And then Dr. Karen Phillips, they recommend looking at her presentation from last month. She talks all about abdominal massages as also a helpful tool. For heartburn or GERD, don't lie down after eating. And then when appropriate, minimize acidic foods or maybe caffeine that can kind of facilitate those symptoms. Biggest thing is add in versus take away foods when you're working with this population. And I know I'm almost out of time, so I'm going to get through the rest of it quickly, but don't work in isolation. These, um, these, both these conditions require an interdisciplinary team, right? So that should include a registered dietitian, um, a primary care physician checking on the medical stability of a client, a gastroenterologist to help with managing GI symptoms, a mental health professional, probably someone that specializes in eating disorders, but also maybe someone that also does psychogastroenterology to help with that side of things. And then also I want to mention additional providers like a physical therapist, an acupuncturist, a yoga instructor can be yoga instructor can be actually very helpful for managing both sides of these conditions. And um, seek supervision when needed. If you feel like you're a little bit out of your wheelhouse, you can learn, you can learn from others. If you're, if you specialize in eating disorders, you can get supervision from someone that specializes in gastrointestinal concerns and vice versa. Now, if someone has an, a more stable eating disorder, there's a little bit more you can do in terms of interventions, especially if your whole team has decided that they're in a good place where they can start working on things, right? So maybe instead of um, an overall low FODMAP plan, you do more of a FODMAP gentle approach, which as you can see in this table is you're kind of picking more of the higher FODMAP foods, and you're just eliminating these select foods first, kind of that whole list of higher FODMAP foods. You also can look at specific FODMAP concerns. If someone's telling you that they're having all of these high sugar alcohol foods, or they're having excessive honey with their tea every day, and they always feel unwell after, you can cherry pick things and start to work on some of these things to help with um, addressing some of these symptoms if it's a FODMAP concern. And then also additional dietary triggers just to keep in mind is that if someone's having excessive alcohol or caffeine consumption, those are natural GI irritants. That could be something that's causing these issues. Maybe they're having excessive fiber. I've had clients um, come to me and they say that they're having 60 grams of fiber per day and what, and they're so bloated and they're uncomfortable, but they're doing it for the purpose of, you know, losing weight and, and not gaining weight. And so we, we talk about how we can kind of decrease that and they even notice some relief in symptoms after doing that. So start to look at the overall big picture of what's going on, what are their habits and try to just pick out some things that could be causing some of their symptoms. And then um, I would love to wave my dietitian wand and fix everything, but I know that I cannot. And I just wanted to list some other non-diet interventions that I often refer out my clients to and recommend to clients. But 
Gut-directed hypnotherapy has been researched to be just as effective as a low FODMAP plan. So if someone is inappropriate for the low FODMAP plan and it doesn't work for them, you can recommend that. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy has also been well-researched to also help with managing GI symptoms. Diaphragmatic breathing, yoga, acupuncture. Um, if someone has a pelvic floor dysfunction, it can't be fixed unless you're doing, because it's an anatomical concern, right? So a pelvic floor therapist can be super helpful with this. And that can be helpful for, you know, minimizing chronic constipation. Medication supplements. So Maybe someone needs metoclopramide or erythromycin for gastroparesis. Maybe with comorbid psychiatric concerns and their overall GI symptoms, they may benefit from tricyclic antidepressants or SSRIs. So working with a doctor to make sure that you're looking at it beyond food, how can you manage this also with medications and supplements? Stress management, and then also sleep hygiene could be a huge miss. Sleep, um, getting enough sleep can be so important for regulating your hunger hormones. And also if you're not getting enough sleep, it can dysregulate them and also cause a ton of GI symptoms as well. So look at someone's sleep hygiene and see how you could help them with a schedule and getting back into a better routine for that. So I know I went a little over, I do apologize, but if you'd like to reach out to me, um, here's my contact information. Um, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram. I haven't been as good lately in posting, but I'm going to be better about that. Here's my email. And then um, also here is my, the group practice that I work for. Here is the e website if you want to check us out. Um, and this presentation has tons of sources. You want to look through the data a bit more. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that anybody has. Thank you so much for your time. Oh my gosh, thank you. Um, this was a wonderful presentation. I learned so much and I'm sure everyone else on the line did as well. Um, we have one question so far, but if anyone has other questions, please submit through the Q&A function at the bottom of um, your Zoom panel. You might wanna put up your contact info screen as well, um, wow. and then they can have that for reference. And I'm glad you haven't been all over social media, doom scrolling, it's good, <laughs> you've got other things to do. So. Um, everyone will get this uh, via recording and you can watch it later at your leisure. Uh, there is so much content in here to learn from and to apply. So um, given that restrictive diets in this population aren't appropriate, what about other guidance like supplementations? Could that also be, or supplements rather, could that also plant the wrong sort of approach? Like, uh, for example, Christine says, somebody might think to themselves, I can take a supplement to nourish myself so I don't have to eat food. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a really good question. And so what I often lead with, if someone has um, several deficiencies or there's kind of concerns around um, not meeting their needs and a doctor or myself recommends, let's say a multivitamin, right? My, I always am upfront and I say, this is a safety net. This is not what we want to be depending on because we're not even sure if we're absorbing everything that's here. So I, I make sure that someone is focusing on their nutrition first and foremost, and always kind of lead with this as a safety net and not our, our ultimate um, plan and option here to help with kind of fixing and working on what's going on here. So it's a great question, um, but it can be helpful, especially if someone, let's say, has maybe um, a vegan or vegetarian diet and there's possibly some gaps that may not be fulfilled as much with what they're eating. Then we'll discuss, maybe there's a need for vitamin D or B12. Um, if there's a history of iron deficiency, we'll work on that. And I'll work on recommending like an iron supplement that's more gentle on the digestive tract as well, because iron can be kind of harsh and cause constipation. So, you know, I'm always trying to make sure that if there is a supplement on the table that I'm also looking at, you know, what are some side effects um, will that affect someone with gastrointestinal symptoms as well? Um, but sometimes it, it is needed um, if someone is really deficient in something. Um, some supplements like magnesium can also be beneficial for someone um, for someone who um, is having chronic constipation. And I just saw someone on the chat said, um, my email is spelled wrong. So I'm so sorry about that, but it's Karuna for you, F-O-R. Um, you you.com so sorry about that no. i type it so often i just i misspelled it 
again, no worries. I think it's very clear. Uh, so all good there. Um, thank you so much. That's super helpful. Um, Wendy asks, do you find that more of your patients are diagnosed with an eating disorder by you, the RD, or by a physician? I kind of see it both ways. Um, and I will say, obviously, as a dietitian, I cannot diagnose. So I just simply kind of come with the information and um, I'll share it with the physician that they're working with. Oftentimes, um, I see a lot of adolescent clients and they're being sent over by their pediatrician. And it's like, we're not really sure what's going on, but you know, I have some concerns here. And then I'll kind of communicate with the, the pediatrician or it, sometimes it's like the therapist. And we'll talk as a group, like what we all think is happening, but obviously I cannot diagnose the dietitian, but I am sometimes the first person that is seeing the behaviors and raising the red flags to either um, the parent, if it's an adolescent or to the physician when I'm meeting with them. So I really do see it both ways, um, but oftentimes just because a dietitian talks about food and they look at patterns in eating, they're often the first person to notice that there is a, there's some disruptive maladaptive eating behavior is happening. That's a great question. Yeah, that makes sense. And then are you, have you seen anecdotally or do you know the statistics around how, what the prevalence of undiagnosed disordered eating or eating disorders is? Yeah. So there's also, um, OSFED, which is the other specified, um, eating disorders, which is basically when someone doesn't meet the criteria per se for, let's say, bulimia nervosa, anorexia nervosa, ARFID, et cetera. And I don't know the exact statistic. I'm happy to look that up. I don't know exactly the percent of the population, um, but I am sure it's prevalent. Um, and there's also, you know, the other side of it is also disordered eating, which is when um, someone obviously has alterations and, you know, it's a little bit off the, the normal eating pattern. Um, or let's say, you know, orthorexia is kind of big where it's not a diagnosable eating disorder, but someone has an obsession with healthy eating. Um, so there's, there's a lot of that happening. And um, I work with clients that have disordered eating that don't, do not um, have fit the criteria for a diagnosable eating disorder. But at the end of the day, um, I don't really get caught up in the diagnosis, I have to say. And I, I've heard other dietitians in this space say the same thing. It's, mm -hmm. it's more just like, either diagnosed or not, how can we work on the relationship with food? How can we get them into a more regular, healthy eating pattern? How can we make food enjoyable and fun again? Um, we're often working on very similar things, whether it's something that's diagnosed or something that is more disordered eating. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Last couple of questions and thanks for everyone for sticking around, especially for you, Marissa, for sticking around to answer more questions past time here. Um, next question is, do you ever see a correlation between food allergies, eating disorders, and GI conditions? Definitely, definitely. And I, I honestly, I feel like I should have put that in my presentation. So that's a really good addition. Um, I definitely see it, especially with food allergies and let's say even like celiac disease. Um, there is definitely a lot there because individuals become a lot of like ARFID too, is individuals become very afraid of having an allergic reaction, whether they themselves have had a food allergy or allergic reaction, or they've seen a family member or somebody else have that reaction. Mm -hmm. And then for celiac disease and food allergies, there's kind of that fear of cross-contamination. And so oftentimes I see with clients, they have a fear of kind of eating out or eating at places that are not their home because they don't have that kind of control over how their food is being prepared. And in a way that, you know, it does make sense, but then it becomes um, very overpowering and controlling and um, it affects how they eat and their relationship with food. And they start to become afraid of food um, in many different situations. So absolutely, there's definitely concerns in that population. Mm -hmm. This is such a big topic. I mean, on any one of these sections, oh. like you could have done an entire webinar on any of them. And because of that, we're going to have next month's clinical webinar with Lauren Adler Deer. It will be on March 23rd. Mark your calendars and we're going to do a deep dive. So hopefully everyone can rejoin us for that. Um, and then the last question here is from Robert. He'd like to know, what do you recommend in terms of getting peppermint oil and taking peppermint oil? And this might be, you know, I know you can't give clinical advice here. Um, so 
what um, whatever you can provide in terms of guidance for peppermint oil supplements? Yeah, so I will first say, speak with your physician to see if it's appropriate for you first and foremost. Um, but um, the one I typically recommend for clients where it's appropriate and it's been approved by the physician uh, is Ivy Guard. And that's honestly sold at like local convenience stores, CVS. Um, I have no affiliation with CVS, but that's, you know, I see that in like Target. Um, and it kind of comes in like a little capsule mm -hmm. and, um, it's can be a little bit pricey and it's limited amount each pack, but you can get it at, at many kind of local chain stores. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you so much, Marissa. This was a phenomenal presentation. We're so grateful that you have shared your time and expertise with us. Um, thank all of you for attending today. We had a wonderful turnout. Please stay tuned for more opportunities to join us like next month on uh, March 23rd with Lauren adler Deer, as I mentioned. Every month we're doing these CPU certified webinars. And we're so grateful for all of you here at Epic Year to be bringing together such a robust community of practitioners like yourselves and to be a tool in your toolkit to help your patients heal with good food. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Please reach out to us with any questions you might have and keep an eye on your inboxes for the recording and CPE certificate. We're getting a ton of thank yous in the Q&A and in the chat, Marissa. So once again, on behalf of the whole community, thank you, thank you so much and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thanks everyone. Thanks, bye-bye.